Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, enough of all this nonsense. Uh, I wanted to catch up at a point where I was less jet lagged than I was last time and give you a little bit of a rundown on the trip and on some of the little, well, challenges we we're facing. And first of all, and most importantly of everything, we absolutely now have to stop the war in the Ukraine because now it has gone too far. My baker, my Danish baker in Culver City have announced and told me that she can no longer bake my marzipan pastries because the marzipan is usually coming from the Ukraine and she can't get it anymore. And that is where I draw the damn line. I don't care what you do, but when you start messing with my pastries, it is fighting time. So there, and I'm still on my now fourth month without coffee and energy drinks. So the fact that I'm still upright and coherent, well, we got to take that as, as, uh, as it is. And... One of the things I had wanted to give you a little bit of breakdown again as I am communicating back and forth with the people in Austria about Bergkristall and about the Mauthausen report, and that's not as productive as I had hoped. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and see if they actually one day will answer any questions in relating to their own uh, report, which it doesn't seem that they really, really want to do at all or share information. In fact, they took offense that I dared ask questions, questions we've all been asking, and I haven't even hinted at anything inappropriate. I just wanted to ask how they came to the conclusions they did. So we are still um, communicating with, the, with them in, to some degree, but fortunately there's also now Austrian politicians who have joined in uh, on our side because they want to know uh, what is going on and, and why these places can't be seen and visited. So um, there's a lot to it. And as I have made clear uh, sooner or later, I will tell you all exactly what has been said and done. And I really don't want to make bring this, make, make this my own opinion. I want them to actually answer questions on, uh, on their own report. You, you would think you write a report, you would think you can, you could be able to do that. And it's, it's a little bit, that's what I, didn't want to talk specifically just talk about it, but is it a cover-up or is it just because we don't want to talk about it and you see the same thing all over germany and austria where they have destroyed so much and deliberately destroyed it and don't want to talk about it they don't want to talk about it i get it it but it it seems like an, an evolution of the 1945's um denazification projects that is still going on to the point that now we don't even want to talk about the past. We don't want to uh, talk about anything that happened. It didn't happen. It didn't exist. And the, the joke in Austria is that according to Austria, Hitler was German and Mozart was from Vienna. Uh, speaking of rewrite, um, it's become such a bad joke that some people are actually starting to believe it out there. And that's what happens when you rewrite history. And I, I'm working on doing one on the Stalin uh, show trials of the 30s and the, the starvation of the Ukraine, just because history is repeating itself in, in places where people don't look and no one seems to know a damn thing about history. And it is so interesting that now we are like 90% down of uh, views on, on uh, or the revenue on YouTube from, from January. So apparently everybody have lost their interest in history since January, um, or it's just not interesting enough and we need, we need short fluff. That's, that's the way we are. It is an uphill battle that's going to be spent and fought a lot in archives and at some point in time courtrooms because there will be lawsuits. If we want the information we want, then there's going to be lawsuits. Uh, filing uh, official legal claims for the release of information. We're going to do that. And that, of course, also boils down to money, but that will eventually be done. I uh, spent some nice time with uh, General Kamala's family. And I just heard from uh, the generals, uh, the grandson of his uh, driver as well. And now that a lot of people from that time, I miss, uh, I met uh, Patton's granddaughter, a uh, very interesting uh, lady. So there's a lot of interesting people that are seeing what, what, what I've been trying to do and that are now coming out and, and asking to join my battles or me to join theirs. So. It, 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 that, which was the whole idea of why I wanted to make start making these presentations 
is for us all to join together, share information, and together arrive at, at what the truth is. Uh, not find one side's truth or the other side's truth, but actually a ride of the truth of the events as they happened. And um, that's, I think, is why we're all here. And that's one of the requests I had to you guys, because I'm, like I said last time, and some of you, I don't know why I'm, I'm, I'm asking you guys, because we all know it takes me six months to check my emails. Anyway, however, I'm, I'm trying to get through it. <clears throat> and some of you guys I met uh, out on the trips, and we, we, been researching stuff uh, and you've been sending me information and I haven't responded yet uh, I will as soon as I start getting into what that actually event is that we've been uh, I'm trying to take it in time and, and piecemeal yes I, I came home to a whole lot of fires that had to be put out and I'm still trying to put out uh, out here both uh, uh, everything landed on my plate and including old old friends in trouble and military and there's just a crap load of stuff even my cars that's are in service that had to be done so everything is a little bit scattered right now and i'm trying to prioritize um <clears throat> outstanding and so you on vacation some of you around the world and i'm going to add you guys all to the stream in a minute when i'm done uh with my 30 second rant which i am in a minute uh, which has now lasted uh, six minutes and 30 seconds. But I should be a politician. I can't obviously tell time. Um, one of the things I wanted to do is I'm putting together a lecture for some colleges that I will also offer to the military on, on the military initiative. And by that, I mean individual people's initiative. Now, I'm not talking about uh, the big battle and MacArthur did this or <clears throat> this or did that. I mean individual dudes on the ground who were told to do one thing but did something else that was successful or commanders that did one thing was told one thing and did something else and maybe weren't successful sometimes initiative backfires my case i the case i want to be is i would like to explain to the military in general uh thank you johnny thank you brother uh appreciate it i really do especially now that youtube paid me um I'm trying to build a case for the various militaries in a seminar series where I can explain that the need and the importance of training and educating soldiers enough to allow them a degree of initiative, a little bit like the German military had uh, during World War II and to a slight degree during World War I, where a lot of uh, it was always important for the soldiers to train for the next the guy ahead of you. His duties you had to know the guy below you had to know his his duties and and the job station and if commanders all the way down to sergeants a lot of sergeants became officers because the officers was what got killed because they were leading from the front so a lot of people moved upwards and i think that happened in, in a lot of military but in the german military by far lost more uh, officers and ranking officers in combat than any other because they were leading from the front which sometimes is hazardous so you have to get younger lower ranking in order to be able to take initiative. So they need information and they need trust. Um, I see the same thing in, in corporate life. You have all these people who are afraid to take initiative or do things because they might get brained upon. So of course you take initiative and it goes wrong, but you can justify it. You are right, you're excused. You take initiative and it goes right, you should be applauded for it. And we've also seen lately in law enforcement and the military is not just the American one, where the lack of initiative have cost lives. And we have been for a very long time, slowly been breeding initiative out of anybody everywhere in uniform, all to, almost to the point of a dictatorial state, where you see why so many Russian uh, ranking officers are being killed in the Ukraine war now, because they have to move up the line, the communications down, and nobody up the line dares take initiative or knows how to. So I think it's a, for, for all militaries, it is a thing to actually start talking about military initiatives and training and why. And I, I yes, I do. It, of course, all as everything came up a personal gripe, and I'm, I'm going to try to fix that completely. Um, and let's see, uh, I also did. Yes, I do need a lab that can test some soil for residue of explosives testing. If anybody happens to have a lab, knows of a lab, 
the university lab, that's not going to charge us a fortune just to tell me what's in some bags of soil. That would be phenomenal. Um, all right, I see you guys are on. Uh, Ed, I have a few. I have Ed, I have two, one or two of yours. All right, I'm going to add you guys all so we can have that. And now we're all talking uh, on top of each other. Ah, now it's on. All right. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kano. How are you all doing on this, I think, Sunday it was at some point? Good. I'm not sounding too much like a frog. What did you do? I don't know. I've been like this for the past three weeks. COVID.680. I have a question for you. What's yes, that soil sampling? Here in Alabama, they have a, um, how would I put it, a farm extension bureau that they will test dirt and they will tell you what's all in it. Oh, that, okay. Farm. Do you have one of them in California? Because there's a bunch of farmers out there. Yeah, I don't think anybody in California seems to like the farmers. Um, uh, farm extension, that's actually an interesting thought. Uh, I would imagine, they don't they only do this for soil that is sort of domestic and have some relevance to America? They don't have to know that. <laughs> if I give them some soil and it comes back with like 10 different types of explosives and radiation, <laughs> don't you think they're going to ask me questions about where in California I found it? No, just tell them you felt you went to New Mexico, and you were out at Trinity. Uh huh. Uh, yeah, it's I it's an idea. I, th I think this comes under the heading of what could possibly go wrong here. Uh, like my my email saying, "Hey, blowing up New York." <laughs> but it's it is an idea. I can see if I can find out. Well, I could call Auburn. Is uh, there? Uh, I was going to talk to the, there's a university that tested uh, the ceramic uh, thing that Andrea Sulza found out in uh, by the dig out by uh, the octagon, and they, he sent it to uh, an American university and they looked at it. And I was thinking about asking if if, that, if they have that interest to in, uh, keep it some in civilian hands, um, but I mean. It, 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 I, I, I can look and I can ask, but I would be honest with them and tell them where it actually came from. Because, well, they also at some point I'm having to do a report and, and, and to me that I can give to you, say this is where it came from and so this is what is in here. Um, well, like I said, I could always call Auburn because they're an, an agricultural school. Yeah. And they do testing. So I'll get on the phone tomorrow and call them and see what's up. Well, see if you can save your voice first. I'm trying. <laughs> How are you doing, Paul? It's been a while. Good. Yeah, I that PDF you put up, right, with the the bunker buster bombs. Yeah, the one. The, oh, the one. Uh, what that's were the really bad photos because it was horribly scanned by some government uh, agency. I didn't go. I started reading it, but trying to maybe read between the lines and the timing of it. Uh -huh. Like, I think the British knew about maybe the base in Del Fuego and maybe they were thinking about bombing it. Yeah. Possibly. And then that, they were trying to test out the bombs, obviously, in France. Yep. If they built the Shangri-La down there, supposedly, I mean, it seems like, you know, there was this timing where they they kind of wanted to get it accelerated to do something. And I just didn't understand, well, why you're testing these bombs now? I mean, the war is over with, right? Yeah, there was an awful lot of testing that happened right after the war. Right. Oh. So it was kind of like, I'm thinking, hmm, maybe they, you know, they knew, I know the Brits had some secret bases down there and they, they probably wanted to get the Falklands back, right? <laughs> yeah. So. My thinking is, it's sort of like, okay, we got to tell the Americans because really they're the ones that have the resources to really go down there. And, yeah. You know, 
You know what I'm saying? So they said, okay. And then if things don't work out with high jump, maybe we can just yeah. bomb the place or something like that. I don't know. I'm just I mean, it, 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 I, I think all, uh, all militaries, it, it's interesting because if, if we really start digging into wars, we'll come into military contractors and we'll start running into bankers and we'll run into money. And military contractors, they want to test all their gear. I mean, you, you've seen that in pretty much every war, especially as the development of military technology from the beginning to the end of the war escalates. So when we get to the end of the war, a lot of the a lot of these guys, they may have stuff that like, oh, shit, we didn't get to use this in the actual war, but we still need to test it while we still have an appropriation to doing so. So let, let's speed it up. And plus, of course, the war in Japan was still going on. That's true. Yeah, um, I guess I, it's right. But yeah, I was just kind of like, since it was the Brits that were yeah. sort of me initiating it, you know what I mean? I don't know. I think it was kind of like, I was like, hmm, maybe we were sort of like, they were going to go down and see if they could take the base, and they had a backup plan. Maybe they could use these bunker buses. Because remember, it seemed yeah. like, you know, they were trying to test it at an angle. Yeah. You know, there was these things where how to, it comes in at a sort of a certain angle instead of straight down because maybe it is built into a mountain or something like that. You would think they definitely, yep. Yeah, and I wonder if they were, was, was there any, I, have, I haven't had time to go through that report myself. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's a long thing and I, I just started reading it and I'm just sort of like, hmm, maybe there's something to this, but I Steve, am. I haven't gone through the whole thing. I mean, I've got I was, I was wondering if they were incorporating any of the German guided technology because that, yeah, that right. just sprung in really quick because that would be a way. I mean, the Germans had bunker buster bombs too and munitions right, right. and uh, doing a bunch of specials on those. Because so they, they tested the first, uh, what is it, kind of like the first cruise missile. That one they did. They took out ship. They did. Both yeah. the camera guided, wire guided. You have the Richelieu yeah. shell that we saw in, in Fort Abon and right. what turned into the V3 that was right. actually used to shell, um, to shell, um, it was not Liege. Yeah, the uh, I was it Antwerp, Luxembourg. Bloody hell, uh, I, I, Luxembourg. Uh, they fired almost 200 shells at Luxembourg, and it was interesting. But Kamla was actually there. Uh, we always said that the V3 gun didn't work because the Allied testing afterwards. It seems that they only captured uh, test projectiles without fins, so they couldn't make it work because they thought this is what it had to be. And I'm, I'm digging into that now because I went to the site, which is it laid, they literally laid it up on a steep hill, pointed it to Luxembourg, and Kamla was there at the first shots. And they fired some 200 of them, and they worked even with aerial uh, spotting from, from the jets, from the Arado, which it was very all very advanced. And I wonder how fast the Allies could turn around some of this tech and to stick it on their own and test that on some of the German bunkers, which would sort of make sense. Uh, um, well, it could have been part of the deal, like, well, we won't use them so we can sell it to you or not sell them, but, you know, make the deal yeah. at the end of the war type of thing, you know. A lot of it was test was done and uh, developed on in Pinamunda, and all these guys were handed over as part of the deal. Mm. And then you had the, the school tobacco staff that mm. what happened to them was a little bit less clear. I think some of them made it over, uh, over to the Americans as well. So, but I think definitely a lot, a lot of the guided munitions, they were done under the German, by the army and they were done in Pinamunda. And that was handed over to the Americans along with the rocket research. So that would have happened quite clear. What the heck? Warm beer? Sorry, I got distracted by a note on how did you guys get on warm beer while we're not, we're talking about bombs here? <laughs> like... <laughs> That is a distracting, uh, distracting uh, piece of information here. My throat. Oh, they're telling. Oh, they want you to drink. I'm getting, water. I'm getting ideas and and drugs. Uh, how about just how about the uh, Nyquil and then some uh, Psycam with some zinc in it? I can't take that. It's a dissolvable. I know it is, but I can't take it because of my heart. Zinc. Yep. Oh, Chris, well, I hope you do okay. I had a bad case of uh, COVID. I had been hospital. I was in the hospital about what, two different hospitals for about six weeks. Oh, really? my God. Yeah, it was, a, it 
Which, well, uh, machine machines uh, just get starting to get over it again. Yeah. So you, so so you had the old COVID. You had you had the. I, had, I, I don't know. Maybe you had that 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 variant, the super variant. I don't know, but you know the Redesafir is another thing that, that you know they have the protocols in the hospital, which you have to take. They make you you know you're in that once you go in. Hopefully you get out. It's kind of like this Roach Motel thing. It's Redemisphere, Fauci, you know, authorized to use in the hospitals can stop your kidneys from working. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, I was in there and I'm like, when is the last time I took a piss? You know, and I'm like, but I think what it is, is the nurses and some of the doctors kind of know what the drug's doing. So they kind of like take it off. And then maybe yeah. they'll put it back on, that kind of thing. So yeah, the, the, so I have a friend who's got COVID now, and she was told by the doctor to take um, to, to to go get to the emergency room and get that that shot you get the, the whatever it is, a vitamin concoction, but it might uh, do liver and kidney damage. And we just kept saying, "No, you know." She, she yeah, well, I think it's like lung damage. I mean, yeah. there was you know the philia. You know, you're damned if you do, and damned if yeah, you don't. It was like, I, if I basically my feeling is if they just gave me a an antibiotic, I probably would have been out of there in like seven to ten days. But you know, that that's the that's what that's what that's what I did when when I had mine. I went down and got myself a B shot, a C shot, a C shot with zinc, and a D shot. And then I went home and then I night cooled myself up and went to bed for three days. There you go. Well, that was it. Just uh, sort of. Just one know. problem for me to get four to see nine. my doctor. I have to wait at least four days. Yeah. Really? But you don't have a no ER. I'm to stay out of the hospital. That's all. I'm to tell you. <laughs> yeah. If you go to the ER at Martin Army, you're going to be there for ten hours. Yeah. Beach well, two days, four days. I mean, maybe maybe we can find. I was a there. Us. I was there Friday for four hours to get one prescription filled. Ew. It's getting bad. Rachel. Military. Rachel, you're very quiet. Yes. Um, just a tip for Crystal, okay? Um, I do a lot of vitamin C, okay? Out of between 5 and 10 grams a day with a good binder in it that's not got all that talc in it, okay? Yeah. And I've been I taking also, vitamin C. Okay, good. And the next step is for a natural source of zinc, which won't hurt your heart. And that's potatoes, particularly baked potatoes. The skins are a very good source of zinc. And just have yourself a baked potato with butter every day. And keep well, you see, this away. is the other problem. I have to worry about what I eat. I'm diabetic. You know, there's new information coming out that says the pancreas is infected with the bacteria that is probably causing diabetes and not a carbohydrates. Well, I you see, this is the problem. I think when I start taking insulin besides all the damn uh, bruises I get is yeah. I start feeling worse taking the insulin. Yes, yes. But it's a medical racket. I mean, you know, it, yeah. it's a revolving door between I know it is. Yeah. But uh, you, so, you're, right about, you're right about the potatoes by not boiling out the uh, the vitamins. Same thing with most of the steaming things are usually better. But Crystal, you can eat, you can eat potatoes, can't you? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean... I always eat the skin of a potato. I have ever since I was a little girl. Yeah, but it's true. But baking or steaming things are better. It maintains the integrity of the of the vitamins. If we could just find a, a nice shaman for us all to fix everything. Um, I will I say, eat Rachel, most of my vegetables. Uh, I I mean, I have a vegetable once a month, just you know, for novelty. Uh, I usually you know stir my ice cream with it. But um, I will say, right, one thing about. C vitamin. I did the same thing when when uh, when I got the flu. I just triple up on my C vitamin. Had four, five, six thousand milligrams a day. 
took us from from competing. I knew I every C, the C vitamin vitamin your body doesn't utilize, you just pee it out. There was a problem, however, after a little while of that, it messed up my stomach, mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't figure out why. And it took me six months to figure out that I had just been eating too much C vitamin because of the acidity will mess up your stomach lining. So don't do that for a long time. That's a different thing. That's uh, when you go and buy low acid orange juice. It, that's exactly right. And probably the same well, thing. With the I, they were worried about me because my vitamin D level was really low. So yeah, once you know, a week I take once a week I take a fifty thousand milligram vitamin D pill. I get a shot every uh, every other couple every two weeks of D vitamins. Which and is I am the biggest. Yes, I am the biggest cheese and milk. Um, somebody has noticed that we turned into the to, to the uh, medical channel for a minute there, and we should get back to World War Two or a World War War War, and we probably should because that'll get us in less trouble. Uh, we can always do this one on a, in private, but yeah, let's uh, let's get let's, what is uh, Baldrick said. Let's get back to the lovely war then, um, whichever one it was. Which one? We uh, hey, I got a question. The movie, Shoot. the movie. Yes, now, the movie was done like over a span of certain time because I could see that. Don't give it away. I know what you're going to say. Don't. No one will notice if you don't say it. Okay, I know I because I noticed it. Shut. <laughs> I'm not saying a word, but I noticed it. We, there, there's a time lapse between the two fronts. Don't question it. Okay. okay. It may have been a five year yeah, time lapse. Just a couple of months. <laughs> just a couple of months. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go. I, literally, I shot uh, Iron Cross, The Road to Normandy, the one I did. It's on my Patreon, Ed. Um, but if not, uh, shoot you me an email. Uh, the one I just, I, I have, I did a war movie. The last one I did, it was released in June. Um, I think it's better than the first one. I didn't, I didn't know you did movies. Uh, that, that's <laughs> how I started when I, when I got out of the army. I started on, a, on a, the TV show E-Ring and Crossing Jordan and Numbers and CSI and all that stuff. And I, I'm just... But... I'm just History's throwing your train. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, know, you did another movie that was in Normandy too. Was that? Yeah, I, I, I did, and I wanted to. I wasn't happy with it, and I wanted to. That, that's why. That's why Iron Cross came about because I really was. There's so many things I wanted to do on Normandy that I couldn't do, and things that went wrong, and some logistical issues. Let's go with that. Um, and I wanted to film under actual bunker locations. Because it's just we knew they were there, and that didn't actually happen um, until until years after uh, Red Rose. And I said, you know what? We, I, I want to tell a story about the, about soldiers. I wanted to be a soldier story. I didn't want uh, any any distraction from that, and that's why I wanted to. So we started pulling together. Like a lot of you have written about the Goliath uh, by as a little mini tank. And as soon as I log, as soon as we done here, this will not be the longest chat in the world. I did put a little uh, history of the Goliath uh, documentary together that I will put that I will uh, put up um, on uh, that'll come on live on YouTube as soon as we leave here. By the way, um, but what I wanted to do sh show a whole lot of small stories. Same thing with, with, with Brother Brothers War. There's all these little stories that you. It's a good way to tell war. It's a good to, way to tell military history because people they don't. They don't read books, especially younger. They don't read books the way we do. So if I take the stories from the books, from history, from events, and I stick them in a war movie, then there's a chance they'll see it, they'll be entertained, but it's based on real little events, even if they happen to, to 20 different people. I think it's the best way to teach history. And that's why that's sort of why I got in. I ended up on, on TV and ended up doing movies because I wanted to take... I did a couple of movies on human trafficking, mm -hmm. sex trafficking, because it's important, Watch and them. it's actually a hell lot more important than anything else is to protect our women and children. And the best way of doing that, the way I know, is to side up with the Hollywood crowd and tell real stories. So when we talk about the movies, we talk about the real, real events. And that's one thing that drives me crazy uh, is you, you look at wars and you look at, at civilian life today. Who's really suffering? It's always women and children. 
for the most part. We're men. We, we march off towards gunfire and die. That's what we're supposed to do. And children don't have to. And we seem to have forgotten that. And I, I drive through downtown LA. I see homeless people, uh, homeless women, sometimes children running around. It's heartbreaking. And same, so, so I did the movies about the human uh, about the human trafficking, just like the war the war movies, because I want to tell stories that are important. I think the best I way. Want to see, I want to see the one that you did, the German aircraft carrier. Uh, you know what? That we never finished it. It was a I, documentary about the Zeppelin, which was the German aircraft carrier that they built, and there was so much going on with that that they never. It. Yeah, I can't. Uh, as everything in Hollywood always revolves around people eventually arguing and fighting and lawsuits and everything becomes a pissing contest, as so did that. And that is that is very unfortunate. Um, so that will never actually go anywhere unless I become a millionaire and I buy everything back from uh, from people, even though I already paid for it once. Uh, that That's a shame, though. How many reenactors? How many reenactors do you use? Every damn one who wants to show up in your movies. Oh, everyone who will show up. Oh, everyone I can afford. Yeah. Was uh, it, uh, do you, do you pay them or do they volunteer? Uh, yes. If we have, it's it's we've. Uh, we've I mean, I I, I know. <laughs> I know a lot of reenactors. I know a lot of friends that, that, that reenact. And sometimes when I can get out uh, to the East Coast, we'll fight together. Um, and a lot of movies we've done, uh, also movies from Hollywood, where um, where we have come in, came in with a budget and everybody gets paid. And then there'll be like Iron Cross. I literally did Iron Cross for practically no money. I did it all myself. Uh, I, for the most part, I ran the camera, I did the editing, I set it up, I did the CGI, which is why it's so crappy. Uh, but there was no, and I told everybody, listen, we, I want to do this movie. It's, it's going to come out. It's going to be a proper release as it is, but there's no money to pay anyone. If you guys want to come play, come play. And a lot, and everyone did. So, and I think this is, so that also be the next time we, and everybody's written me back that we want to do more movies and I'm have ideas and let, let's so i'm looking at war stories that happened that we can do successfully and obviously i would love to if you can't at least afford to pay people then feed them so i think i fed everybody you know it was cold pizza and, and old coffee but you know hey cold pizza's good now if you come to the south i'm willing i worked i was in drama in high school so i pretty good at building sets that's the wonderful thing about working with military and actors is that they always have the right gear. They always, they, they know the set dressing, they bring it themselves because everybody has stuff that we all want to show. So it makes setting up a, a, a lot. A lot of guys have written me that we have this trench line here. We have this, we come film it. And which, which is really, was awesome because then you show up at a, at a completed trench line. Uh, Brian, your device is not connected. I just I saw dug you, uh, my share of foxholes. LeMay or LeMay? Uh, um, it's, that's exactly it. That, that's why it makes it it makes it realistic. Uh, I would love to, this, this autumn, I'm hoping to be able to go to the, uh, the East Coast and start doing uh, some of the Civil War forts. And now that's some hardcore reenactors, but they also know the history. And if you want to show the next generation how they how it was you lived back then, there's so few photos, but you can set up a reenactor camp that is 100% authentic and show them that. And it's a good it, it's military reenactment is one of the most important things tools we have in in military history. Um, I've got a bunch of uh, pictures of a reenactment they did at Andersonville. Uh, what, what did they do? I, I, I burned five rolls of film that day. Burn video next time. Um, Brian, uh, or Brian, by the way, your device is not connected, so I cannot add you. It is not personal. Uh, and yes, anybody who wants to come come uh, do some movies with us, absolutely. It will be nice. I am actually planning on doing a motorcycle movie next because 
okay. gonna take it. Yeah, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take a break from World War II. Uh, okay. Do something. Else. Sure. Have some, have some, some pretty girls and uh, have some bikes and and you know. Okay, my Nikon will take movies. And indulge me, uh, Brian. You checked out as well. No, no, you're not. They're not. Um, but I, I think it, that's one of the things. Who's talking? Am I shut? Am I cutting someone off? No, I'm talking. All right, somebody's playing me in the background. Uh, Kill your, uh, kill, kill your speaker. Uh, kill your speaker. Or your, yeah, you, yeah, you kill, kill if you got YouTube on. Kill you, whoever is playing me in the background. Kill the speaker. Because otherwise, I hear myself talk. God knows I'm crazy God enough. I'm crazy enough. Uh, 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 we can do that. Um, um, never mind. Never mind. Um. um all right. So one of the things that have you guys ever heard of the uh, Mises battery? Isn't that the one in France? The one, the one in France. The one yeah. In France, yeah. And, uh, and uh, Paul, you Paul, are listening you to are me listening on a speaker, on a so speaker I can hear my playback. my playback. Why? Why? Paul, you're very quiet. Paul, you're very quiet. Well, I'm. I was just muted myself because I thought maybe that was I was wrong. No, uh, I'm no, talking about, about the other ball. Amos, me. You. I'm very quiet. I'm all for two balls. I didn't realize. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Um, yeah. Yes, it's the one out in the. Uh, uh, Mises is really, really, really interesting. Really interesting. And. and been a lot of time lot of with the time guys, out there. guys out there. And. and um, um, I got a I got very a long story, story about story what happened, what how, happened, that happened how that happened, uh, uh, and what has and been, what found, been found, including the fact that there was quite a lot of SS, of SS uh, units, uh, units out there, out there, out there and, and in Normandy and in general, in which general, has always been claimed that there wasn't. That there wasn't. And, and he got hey, 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 wait, wait, wait. Hey, hey, huh? hey, um, let me just say this. I'm getting finished with my novel, and I have a, a unit that's up in Normandy. In the, you in do? the novel, yes, I do. It's Ooh. funny. It's, it's a fictional unit, but they, you know, it was sort of like I had it where uh, Himmler wanted them represented up there, so they sent this unit. I fascinated with um, Goetz von Berlichen, you know, that 17th SS division. Yeah. So it was sort of like a like it was kind of battalion that was kind of battalion thrown together real quick, and they they sent them up to the big coat. So it's in my novel. In my novel. Yeah, but I'm just gonna be. I wanted to email you because I kind of want to have a sort of a military look at my novel. Especially now that now that we know that they were actually there, because there was always this big. There was some fifteen hundred. A lot of um, a lot of SS that came in um, at at the very uh, just a few days before the D-Day landings, and they and they stationed with an air with a uh, aircraft uh, anti-aircraft unit around the Mises battery, and they kept fighting for three days. So the question was always: Did the Rangers sit still in the wrong place? Did they move forward? Did they give the right orders? And I'm I'm. One of my friends from the, from when the movie we did Brothers War, uh, Hugh Daly, his son is a ranger, so I'm going to go out there and do an interview and hear hear their take on this as well. Because post war, this was very quietly just not talked about. Uh, it was sort of it it was just we don't done we don't talk about this, um, and they didn't. And they sort of buried it until he found it in the archives, and he took a lot of flack for it because uh, who wants to who wants to uh, to wake up uh, sleeping lions, right? And of course, we have a guy who's a war hero. So, but there's a lot of infighting. There's a lot of was a lot of arguing behind the, in the Allied commands. A lot of agendas that is very interesting. And I think it's uh, we talked about doing the uh, the, the movie. As I do in the movie of this, and I thought that would be really interesting. Uh, since he well, executed most of it, we do it in place. Matt, in my my in my novel, 
the group, well, the main character is, there's a lot of hiding going on, but he's Michelin, you know, the half yeah. he's, he's hiding that. Of course, I'm not going to ruin the, the story here, but the unit is sent to work as liaison with the paratroopers. That's the way I set it up. Okay. So they were going to do these maneuvers with them. And of course, then Normandy starts. Yeah. To tell so you the honest to God truth, I've never seen a ranger here in the, at Fort Benning wait around for something to happen. They're always up to something. True. Um, I think what there, I mean, it's, we spent two hours going over, literally just going over the rudimentary uh, documents and the conversations and the dailies of the orders given that may not have been received. And I, I have, I have a copy of them all. So before I can even get to the episode, I have to read, I get like a thousand pages in to, to, to point that out. And I think there was, there's some, there's some, a lot to this that needs to be unpacked. And I, I didn't really, I kind of went into it with no preconceived notions because I didn't really know what he was, um, what he was was going for, or what, what was what was there? But when I heard the story and I saw the documents, I'm like, "There's a story to tell," and I and I think it's an honest story what he found. And I think the mistakes that were made was made by one man, and possibly some miscommunication between um, orders and requests for shelling that wasn't that wasn't adhered to. It's like I. I I, I need I need to try to break it down. It's going to take a little bit of a while, but I think it will be an interesting story because there really is three Allied commanders that were trying to run over each other on a, high, a higher level, and I think that is where the problem started. Uh, but I'll 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 when I when I really get to dig into it, I'll try, try to sit down and go through this. Paul, uh, if you know, some of them are online, but if you can get for a certain battle, you can get their AARs after action reports. That's what we have. I've read some of the ones from my father's unit. Yeah, that were in Italy, and it gives you all sorts of interesting facts: what they went through, how many they lost, what their objectives were. But if you can get a hold of AARs. Jacob, well, we, 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 have, we have information. See, we, we have them, and that was another problem because then when they were finally released, he brought them to the guy who wrote them, and he sat down with him and did an interview. I mean, he interviewed all these people, so it's not like it, it's not so there's no hearsay. And when he did that, uh, it turned out that well, these guys were in the, they're in the middle of a war. And he had delegated to somebody else just write up what happened today. So when he was confronted with it, and then he signed it, and when he was confronted with the AR, he said, well, I don't actually know because I wasn't there. I was just the one they asked to write the report. And I just took hearsay from a corporal or whoever said he was there. And that's where it gets interesting because he had actually admitted, that, yeah, we, we sort of put something in the report. We, it may not be entirely correct. Um, and they also, there's references to, to several SS uh, prisoners that were shot and firefights at the Mises with, uh, there's an SS uh, officer that's buried there that was shot. So they were involved in the fighting right there and none of the prisoners of them, uh, survived. So, I mean, so there's, there's a lot of stuff, but shooting prisoners in, which is why I, I sort of try to put that in on all sides in, 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 in the movie, because all sides shot prisoners in World War II. It's really, it's, it's sad, it's tragic, but it still happened. And everybody did it for yep. expedience, Ooh. for anger, hey. or it, 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 The order, it, there was an order with the allies for the first 72 hours not to, to take prisoners. Yes. From what I understood. They, they didn't have to take any prisoners, so you know. They were, and, after, and after the mass of the Malmedy thing, uh, the same thing went out that no no SS prisoners were taken for the next week or something to that effect. Oh yeah, it was brutal. I mean, and it's it interesting brutal. because if you start digging into the Malmedy thing, most I think there was five convictions that was upheld, 
but everybody of the SS post-war and the war crimes, uh, crimes trial were overturned. They were all released. And so there's, there's a, now, now there's another problem. Did that really happen? And certainly did it happen the way we were told, uh, which it seems, well, since everybody was released short of five, it probably didn't. And yeah, you know, you know, Scotty, I just saw, saw the note that the Japanese were brutal. Yeah. American, there was an attempt at an escape. Like, there was kind of like a. Yeah. There was, they, they were going to try to escape, or there was kind of like this little revolt. And maybe it was just sort of like, screw it. Let's just. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it you know, was I mean, so the same. Because I don't, you know, Piper, as way as Piper was, I don't think. He would have given that order to do that. He might just get him yeah. junior or say, like, I agree with that. It. And then just like, well, you know, it's on you. I'm I'm off to over. I got to do this. So, you know, whatever. You I need, agree with that. But also, you when, when, when you're looking at, look, when you're looking at, an, at the Allied armies, and again, I'm not really, not, not, not pointing fingers because this, I, I don't think that's what it, what it, what this is about anymore. It should just be about well, what actually happened because human nature is human nature, and if, when you see it, an allied arm and the SS know that their their people their prisons are being shot. Well, that's going to weigh in on them as well. So now we're looking at a whole lot of retaliations that keeps going on all sides, which is also not. Um, but it also happened uh, quite early on. That, that's I mean, right. In 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 in. Um... Uh, 1940, uh, Dunkirk, there were um, a load of uh, British troops who were killed at Wormhout, which is twinned with the village, town just down the road from me. Um, and they were captured by the SS and were uh, marched into a... Uh, large uh, bomb and we shot i remember hearing that um and i think I, the germans particularly the ss and the more extreme nazi supporters were the ones who at the end of the war were looked at more carefully from the point of view of war crimes. You're right. Because it was known by the British and Americans and the French that um, nobody was perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of, you had the situation that at... Um, Sword and Juno, um, one of the reasons they were slower getting off the beach than um, Montgomery had originally said was because they had so many prisoners. Yeah. Because, I, 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 because they, 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 they disagreed with the order of uh, don't take right. prisoners. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's, that, that's very valid because you you have especially towards the end of the war from the german side most certainly the fanatics will will swing why everyone else is is trying to just survive until the end because they knew mm -hmm. the end is coming and if you were a fanatic and the, and we had fanatics on all sides we had people that hated the other side on every side yeah. where it became more than a soldier's war but it it becomes this this hatred and every, and you also have to boil that down to individual agendas if you're a British soldier and your wife and children were just killed in London, or a German soldier and your wife and children just killed in, in, in Hamburg, you go into this war with a hatred of the enemy. Yeah. And probably against the... So you, but you see the overall conflict, both in, in the Allies side and the German side, between the SS and the, and the Wehrmacht, and where they, where they were at odds with each other on how to handle things. And then you boil it down to certain uh, certain units of the Wehrmacht and certain uh, units of the SS, it wasn't everybody was on board. There were so many conflicting opinions and directions within within all of these different branches and countries 
that to, to slice one overall. And that's, I think that's one of the things I always wanted to say. It's not everybody, you can't judge everybody uh, over one knife's edge because everyone had agendas and political agendas and wishes and, and, and ba baggage they bring to the front. Well, with the free French, oh, you, you had a situation where you had the De Gaulle free French. Yes. You had the communist free French. You had yep. the Marquis free French. You had this, that, and the other. Um, a lot of them spent the next year after the, after the war in France had finished taking out people they consider to be con collaborators. Yes. Um, with no, with no, no reason other than the fact that you didn't fight for France, you gave yeah. up. Um, that sort of thing, and you can say, well, everybody's as bad as everybody else. Um, you look at the various SS battalions which were made up of non-Germans. Yeah they were possibly more extreme than Germans. Especially the Ukrainians or the... Or the, the, uh, the Ukrainians and yeah. the um, some of the Slavs. Um, is it Chet Either Chechens or the opposites. I can't remember which without looking it up, but... Yeah. I have some um, pictures that my dad took in Italy. And it was a w Italian woman, but she was a Nazi collaborator. She was a girlfriend or something like that. They cut a swastika into her forehead and they shaved her bald. And they did that all over Europe, Denmark, Norway, France. They did the yeah. same to girls that dated German soldiers. Yep. And then we can sit here today and look back and go, like, I don't think that's that's fair or, or right because, come on. But still, I, sign of the times. And yes, it was the it was society. Fine. Society's yeah. changed now, though. Yeah, but again, we we have to look back and say, well, this see it through the lens of, of back then. Indeed, and we still have we still have human nature, and these things still happen around the world when uh, when there is animosity, animosity, and there's civil wars, and these things still happen. And I don't exactly know how much the Russians and Ukrainians on the ground hate each other, but I would be very surprised if, if prisoners on either side are always treated uh, honorably, to, even today. And you see wars in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, war is not a good, it's not a good time. It bring, does bring out the very best and the very worst of people. Um, but it, it, when you bring up the French resistance and yeah, listen, the Japanese, somebody mentioned like, yeah, certainly the, the, the Japanese. And that's one thing that, that, that annoys the little crap out of me before I get to the French resistance is, well, you still, now it's, it's okay today to have a worn around with a Chekhovara t-shirt or a Lenin t-shirt or a rising sun t-shirt. I don't think anyone who survived the Bataan death march would think it's fun if their grandkid come in with a rising sun t-shirt. Um, but you wear a swastika T-shirt. That's not going to fly. Oh, I know Miss HR would wear a ace tail. My 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 Until godfather. The day she died, she could not stand to be around Japanese. Yeah. Yeah, they're pretty mad. Three and yeah. two. Well, my godfather was a prisoner of war at Shani. Four years. Like, oh, <laughs> it was the worst. Definitely the worst. The Japanese, I think. Paul. I said my my um, godfather was a. Uh, taken prisoner of war at um, Singapore and spent a year in Changi Jail before going on to the Burma Railway. Oy. And um, I remember he wouldn't have anything in the house which was Japanese. Yeah. And now you first... You know, even, 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 you know, it's like, you know, if you... If you had a camera that was, you know, a cheap camera that was made in Japan, it would go in the bin. Yeah. Miss HR was the same way. She wouldn't have anything that was made in Japan. Matter of fact, she drove a Mercedes. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah I have used friends who won't drive them in cars, but, uh, um, but I get it. I, I know uh, a Japanese and a Korean they were dating, and none of their parents would meet the other parents. 
and this yeah. was the parents, not even the grandparents. They were all dead. They're, they're all they're older. Uh, but what I was going to go that when we talk about the French resistance, it's it's interesting because when you talk about retaliations and a lot of what you saw the SS especially did, well, a lot of that was retaliations to what the French resistance did. And then you can say, well, was the French resistance actually legal? Because France had surrendered and signed off that they would no longer fight. And then they went off and fought. So by that definition, you could say the French resistance was a terrorist organization. If you, it's understandable, it's not what I'm saying they were, but you can see from, from the German point of view, that's what the partisans in the East, well, you can see what about the uprisings in Iraq, Iraq had surrendered. Well, it isn't Iraq, I think they surrendered. Uh, but you can always say one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. And I think that's how the, the French resistance were viewed. Also, because they were not really interested, they, they weren't really f fighting. Well, they weren't fighting fair because they, they they really couldn't. But when you see the, the 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 torture and and what they did to German prisoners or Germans they caught, you could it becomes somewhat more understandable why that turns into a quagmire of of retaliations. Um, and it's it's I, interesting. Oh, I think one of the problems you have with. Um, not quite as much in the West, but it did happen. But once you got into Poland and beyond, um, if somebody attacked a a German soldier, yeah, then they would hang fifty. Yeah. Um, you know, and. You know, after um, oh, um, Heydrich was yeah. killed. Oh, yes. The um, yeah. Yeah. They wiped out two villages. Yeah. Which, you know, if 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 Germany had won the war, or if or if Germany had um, in 1941 may got got to the situation where they got stalin to agree a ceasefire at the urals mm -hmm. and germany could have up to the urals and russia would have the rest then yes. those two villages would cease to exist and nobody would ever know about them that's true um, or they would have been celebrated or they would have been celebrated yeah. yeah, it would it would it would depend on what happened. You remember the movie with Rutger Hauer, Fatherland? Yeah, it's it's what thirty years old movie, where the war. Yeah, it was a great movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rutger was a really nice guy. Uh, I, 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 I he will be missed. Uh, he is missed. But yeah, it's it's funny that that, that is sort of the, the whole concept behind Fatherland, and I don't think that's far off because I think that's what would have happened. Every everything would have been covered up. But you look at all the all the atrocities that the Russians did and Stalin did and the communists did. We don't hear about that until way later. Uh, we won the war. Some of the uh, oopsies that the Allies did. Well, we don't talk about those until they finally came out in the archives. So I guess every warring side would have done that. Uh, you yeah, but you didn't. You, you had the situation with Stalin, where Stalin moved virtually all the Ukrainians to another part of Russia. Yes, and starved most of them to death. Yeah, um, and he moved people from you know Crimea yeah. to somewhere else, and you know he 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 wasn't concerned with the average no. Russian person. Or Ukrainian, certainly. Or you, or he Ukrainian, care, or. He didn't care about but, anybody but himself. No, and um, I, you look at you look at pictures of when when Stalin came into power, the Politburo main characters. There were like twelve of them in a photograph. They were all um, murdered. And by the by the end of it, there's I think there's only one of them left. Yeah. Um, I think it was Molotov. Um, who was the only one? All the others had been erased from the photograph. It was still yeah. the same photograph. There was just all these spaces everywhere. It, it, it's interesting. Um, that we can always say that the term "the revolution" eats its own. That's yeah. always been the truth. When you have that that violent overthrow, 
whether it's it's Nazis or communists or or whatever it is, sooner or later they start turning on each other, which is French Revolution. Look at the French Revolution. Oh yeah, oh, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Poor Antoinette got the meat oh, cake. Yeah. She couldn't. Yeah, but uh, poor Antoinette. So can we say there was a French Revolution in 1971, 1871 as well? When they got uh, kicked Napoleon the Third out, while well, he was captured, and probably was that, mini, was that not a mini revolution? They set up little uh, communist um, uh, towns and free towns, and uh, got rid of the monarchy. Yeah, or they kept. They, they just not monarchy, but became a republic. Yeah, they got rid of. They got rid of the um, the Napoleon position of emperor yes um and went back to having a president as such yes um which is what they've got now um but i mean you know sort of well yeah it's it's it's, 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 it looks like canada's not that far 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 behind france at the moment in the revolution department well certainly Certainly, from a presidential point of view. No, actually, he's, a, he's only a prime minister, isn't he? But um, I'm not going to say what I think of Trudeau. What you mean, Emperor oh. Trudeau? Emperor Trudeau. Oh yeah. <laughs> I wish you could have heard my uncle, my uncle and aunt. They lived. They immigrated from Germany to Canada, and lived in Montreal. I wish you could have heard my my uncle. He hated Trudeau. That man's a walking idiot. But, I, well, like, they, I mean, I mean his father wasn't as bad as he is, but it's because I'm mean, this. Well, okay, fine. We can tie this into a World War II discussion, saying, "Well, we had even in the during World War One, we had great statesmen, we had statecraft, and even if they were World War Two, even if it was a person like like Molotov or." I'm not going to say Ribbentrop was a great statesman because he was a bit of a moron on all accounts. But you had great statescraft. You had communications. You had speeches. You had vision, even right or wrong. You you uh, you had you had a Churchill. You had you had people who were smart and educated. Where are they today? Where are the great speeches today? Today they can, we can barely have a formulation of a coherent argument. In, in, in some and they don't know their history so they don't dig in deep into into what would statecraft would be um it seems um, like we have and because well, if they the don't... united states wouldn't have had fdr we would have totally imploded the only problem is fdr did get us into world war ii because of his policies toward japan uh, FDR um, did some 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 things that others. Yeah, I would have interesting to see America without FDR if if somebody else and I cannot remember who ran against him had won to see how that would have gotten America in a different direction. Just out of uh, hypothetical curiosity. Uh, if if he wouldn't have been assassinated, Huey Long wanted to run against FDR from Louisiana. And he no. was way extreme. Was yeah, well, there, was a right, there was a right wing conspiracy that um, the general that became a senator, I think, uncovered. I can't remember the name. Uh, was it um, boy, was the Marine general? And he was became a politician, and there was they wanted him to be, you know. In this conspiracy, this coup, basically. You talking about the one right now? No, no, no. It was in the '30s when uh, oh. FDR was running. Um, the, the general that was doing all the um, the famous quote, like "War's a racket." I can't remember. MacArthur. No. Chesty no, he was no Polar one. Yeah, yeah. Not Polar, no, but he was a Marine. Chesty Polar was a Marine. Polar. Yeah, right. But it, it was he. He went into politics, and then they wanted him to join this 
you know, this conspiracy of taking over the right wing, and he refused, and then he kind of uncovered it later. And I can't remember his name, but anyway. That, that's an interest. That's an, that's just an interesting part of history, and so so is the post World War One near. That was MacArthur was was involved in that, but on the on the oppressing side, when the American World War One veterans came back and they wanted treatment and health care, and MacArthur they, was after World War Two. Same yeah, thing. He was, 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 was anti-communist, wasn't he? Yes, very much so. Uh, MacArthur was again great speeches. I mean, look at MacArthur. I mean, you, you don't hear speech speeches like that anymore. Okay, he probably would have eventually nuked China and a couple other countries. Uh, this is not be. I mean, MacArthur. He was. He was. A, he was a bit of a bit of a bit of a ham, <laughs> a bit of a crazy ham, maybe. Uh, but he was still a man who would deliver great speeches. And Lord knows people would hear them because he was traveled with his own press corps. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a scaremongerist, wasn't he? I'm not going to say what Miss HR said about him. Oh, well, now you have to. She called him when he, she called him a chicken shit son of a bitch. Really? Yep. Why? I mean, what? I mean, I think people either hated or loved MacArthur. I don't think there's any in betweens. Because, because he left. Wainwright holding the bag. Yeah, he he could not he? understand why he um, why he left and he did not stay with his troops. Oh, you and oh you mean uh, uh, Philippines? Yes, right. Corregidor. Well, he was ordered to leave. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, he was ordered to leave. He couldn't but, uh, ordered or not. But still, you could, you know, it's not like he would have been a dog to let's put, this, <clears throat> let's put it in this situation. If it wouldn't have been MacArthur and it would have been Patton, do you think Patton would have left? No. Um, Patton no, would probably have, not. Patton wouldn't have right, even gone right. to the Philippines. Yes, <laughs> he would have. Yeah. Yeah, they, right. did, they, didn't, they didn't stay. The, if, you, if you look at um, the uh, Admiral who was in charge. Um, he... How could that have been Senator Hal Heflin from Alabama? No, the Admiral. You mean Nimitz? No, the one below him. Um, oh. Um... Uh, I've forgotten his name. Um, but he yeah. he wanted to, he, he sort of said, like, you know, there's, there's no point in wasting our time on the Philippines, it's a backwater. We can sort out everywhere else first. Yes, they're they're not, they never supplied that, the Philippines properly. They, they, they can't supply the Philippines once we've gone past them. Yeah. You know, and they, they said that they promised the troops in the Philippines they would, which is why yeah. they, they put as long as they did. Yeah. Uh, but that's a whole different story as well. Bloody hell, the Danish IRS are here. Holy hell, I haven't seen them for a while. Uh, something else, because like I said, this is not going to be much longer today because stuff to do, but I will tell you one thing since somebody just mentioned Freemasons, um, I have a, uh, gentleman coming on here in August, German gentleman who wrote his thesis about, uh, World War II German Freemasonry. And, uh, we're going to have a long chat about that, which by the way, I thought would be really interesting to get some. Sure, we can get some interesting conspiracies going on on Germans and Freemasons and Freemasons before the war. Since he he wrote that, and and I did the, the Brothers War with that that was sort of the underlying theme. Uh, I thought, well, we we have to talk about that for a while. He is incidentally also uh, the curator of the Valentine submarine bunker. So whenever we get uh, we'll get him on, he's going on vacation. And when he comes back, then uh, we'll have him on and live, and then we can ask him all some interesting questions. And then there was something else I was going to tell you, and I forgot what that was. So, uh, Tito, Tito, yes. let me show you. This. Let me show you this book. This is the book of that. Really pretty good. You can see it, and it gives you all the um, daily reports from the division going on. Ooh. Yeah. So it's it's in two parts. I just bought the first part. 
because it dealt with more Normandy, but some great pictures. I that looks English. interesting as hell. Yeah. And, I have made English and French. It's both English and in French. Yeah, and look at it. Outstanding. So yeah. Um, I have made a note of that. Outstanding. Thank you. Um, now, I I have to go because I have people waiting for me now and we have to do stuff. And we're not done, but there's, we're not going to do the four hour today. Uh, don't know why, but uh, yes, yeah, so this is a this is a hectic time, and also something that is completely irrelevant to World War II. But I am actually doing a documentary on homelessness in LA. Because what did you want us to do research on? We're back. I'm, I'm still doing another military initiative, okay. but down down to the people and unit levels would all not the big battles thank you by the way miss uh it. Deadly uh, we couldn't remember his name thank you yay and um so i'm i'm, I'm running around doing it doing a couple of things and but yeah, yeah. But that's what i wanted the, the the people initiative the 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 one on one the guy in the trench who's doing something opposite of what he was told to do and saves the day those okay kinds I of sent you that. three emails and some websites yeah but uh you're 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 way high up on the on the overall battle plan scale well I work my way down we gotta go we gotta go way down into the into the into the trenches um anyway uh when the very second I log off here which is in a second. I will post the uh, documentary I just did for you guys on uh, on the Goliath, the little miniature tank that a bunch of you guys have written and asked what about after you saw the movie about what that was. So uh, that's coming up right now. See, we can nudge YouTube to do something. And uh, it's nice to catch up, and it's nice for you guys all to join me and chat. And next time we'll hopefully do some four hours, but I have to go fix things that are broken. Because when I leave LA, apparently everything breaks and he starts panicking and things catches fire and, and cats and dogs start living with each other and it just becomes a whole nightmare. And uh, <laughs> which is little, the, 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 it, was, it, was, it was not the best trip I had in the world, but coming back uh, made me wish I had stayed because uh, the crap I came back to, like, oi, 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 oi. But that's life, it comes at you sometimes. Been and, there, done that. And I will see you guys, and now I will make this thing public. And Be you guys careful, Dino. Have a good Sunday. It's yeah. only mental health I'm worried about at this point. Mine. You'll hear me. Good. Chat you all. Take care, guys. Thanks a lot. Toodles.